Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the New York State 2020 Cybersecurity Assistance Program. Uh, we will begin our broadcast at this time, and this is part three of a five-part webinar series. This webinar is being recorded and can be viewed at uh, newyorkmep.org. We will conclude this morning's program promptly at, at 12 o'clock after a short questions and answers segment with our presenter, Jake Mihivik. Uh, you may submit your questions at any time during the presentation in the questions section of the control panel. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy this morning's presentation. Next slide. Good morning again, and uh, my name is Corey Albrecht. I am with Mohawk Valley Community College's Advanced Inst Institute for Manufacturing, and you can see my contact information there. Uh, next slide. Okay, so what is the New York State Cybersecurity Assistance Program? This is a grant that was awarded to Mohawk Valley Community College in May of this year, and we have three main tasks or objectives which we have to achieve throughout this program. Task number one is to establish a marketing and an outreach plan with Empire State Development, which leverages the state's regional assets, including a series of five webinars to introduce the program and to highlight the DFARS requirements. Next slide. Task number two is to plan and execute webinars and workshops for New York State Department of Defense companies. These webinars will train companies on how to perform a NIST 800-171 self-assessment and will include guidance on how to access the self-assessment tools. A minimum of 250 Department of Defense companies will be engaged through these webinars and workshops. And the final task number three is to assist companies that uh, may not have the financial and the staff resources to perform an assessment on their own. At least 67 DOD organizations will be awarded through this grant with an 800-171 assessment performed by one of our implementation teams. And the awarded companies should be from as many regions in the state of New York as possible. Next slide, please. And then finally, the partners which we have included in this grant. This grant originated at Empire State Development and NYSTAR, so we certainly thank them for their commitment and their partnership. It was awarded, as I stated, to Mohawk Valley Community College and the Advanced Institute for Manufacturing. We are the administrators of the program. And then finally, we have three uh, distinct partnerships. We have Fuse Hub, Twin State Technologies, and also MTech, which is the MEP um, center in the Hudson Valley region. Uh, next slide. And at this time, I would like to introduce uh, Everton, and he is with uh, Fuse Hub, and he is the New York State MEP Solutions Director. So with that, please take it away, Everton. Thank you, Corey. Good morning, everyone. As Corey said, my name is Everton, and I'm Fuse Hub's New York MEP Solutions Director. Next slide. So you just heard from Corey that the 2020 New York State Cybersecurity Assistant Grant consists of three tracks which are all geared towards the deliverables, of, the deliverables of a minimum of 250 companies that are engaged in self-assessment training, plus six or seven companies receiving a grant to offset the cost of a personalized, personalized assessment. So how do we plan to accomplish this? To do so, we introduce the concept of a DOD cohort program. The cohort shall consist of the following, 320 manufacturers in the DOD supply chain, membership at no cost to the participating companies, statewide DOD networking opportunities, access to resources from our MEP network and partners, and an online platform in support of the self-assessment training. Next slide, please. So now that we know what the cohort consists of, what are the real benefits of joining this DOD manufacturing cohort program? Here are the opportunities open to the members of the program. First, access to an online interactive nine session training course for self-assessment through Teachable, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Training provides content up to CMMC level three equivalent. Virtual office hours with our very own Mr. Paul Laporte, a resident cyber expert. 
networking among cohort members in the DOD supply chain. Six to seven cohort members will be eligible for a grant to cover a personalized cyber assessment consistent with the NIST SB 800-171. Such grants will be $6,000 each towards the 7,500 cost for assessment. The company in this case is expected to pay 20%, which is $1,500. It also includes a letter of completion for the cohort members that finish the program and a similar letter of completion to winners of the grant that also complete the program. You get access to our archive of cybersecurity webinars and workshops, the preparation for the meeting, for meeting the compliance requirements for CMMC, level three that is, much, much more, including you'll be able to be at our upcoming December 9th virtual workshop. The objective of this cohort is to achieve the following by April 2021. We hope to enroll 320 DOD supply chain manufacturers and have them complete the online training. In addition, we hope to conduct the six to seven physical assessments supported by the 6,000 grant each. Next slide, please. And so <clears throat> I talked to you a little bit before about um, the, the, the teachable program. So this online self-assessment will have nine modules and it will cover the security family uh, as described in this SB 800 We will have a learning assessment or a little quiz after each module to test their knowledge and plus the certificate at the conclusion of that module. Um, you can see on the screen here the families, of course I won't go through that, take too much time, but uh, you can read that another time. So if we have the next slide please. I mentioned about the five part webinar series early. As you can see, this is the third one we're going through. The next one, we'll have the, <clears throat> the thread at home and that will be doing December 15th. And the general advice and pointers one will be done January 26, 2021. If you are a manufacturer in the DOD supply chain, I urge you to take advantage of this program. Please join the cohort by going to NewYorkMEP.org cohort apply. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Mr. Jake Mahivik, Dean of the School of STEM at MVCC. So, Jake, please take it away. Thank you. Good morning. Please stand by as I get everything set up for the presentation. How does that look? Do you have my presentation? I have your picture, but not your presentation. Okay, stand by. Yep. Do you have it now? Yep. Okay. So good morning, everyone, and thanks for being here with us. My name is Jake Mihivik, and I'm here to talk about the cybersecurity threat landscape, enemies and attacks. I'm happy to be part of this. I'm the Dean of Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math at Mohawk Valley Community College. I'm also the director of the National Security Agency's CAE Regional Resource Center. We, MVCC, has a very strong cybersecurity program, and we were invited to be a part of the National Security Agency's National Centers of Excellence for Cybersecurity Education. And in that, I've done a lot of traveling and attended a lot of happy hours with government officials and people from all across the, the cybersecurity domain. So I think I have a pretty good story to tell and I hope you find it interesting this morning. Uh, you can see there the rest of my background. I, I have some technical certifications. My master's in, is in cybersecurity from Utica College. and. Uh, I'm, I'm now mostly focused on education and cybersecurity. Uh, also note, uh, I'm affiliated with MVCC and the National Security Agency, but everything in this presentation is completely my view and does not reflect theirs. So the big picture of cybersecurity is the threat landscape and, and what we think about as professionals and what we need to defend against. And you see in the middle, the United States is in the middle of three different major 
domains of attacks from cybercrime, information warfare, and cyber espionage, each of which may touch you and your organization, uh, and, and I hope that they don't. But you see the United States in the middle, and what that implies is that we are really, we're being targeted from all over the globe right now because the United States is, uh, has the largest collection of intellectual property. We have the things that everyone else wants, and that leads us to be mostly on the defense and not playing much offense. So I don't know if you're office space friends, but if we could get some good news instead of bad news, that would be great. Uh, the bad news is that this presentation is a little dreary. Uh, there are a few rays of light in this presentation where we, we are making some progress, but in general, uh, the, the situation is dire. So to, talk, to start the discussion, I, I, I go all the way back to 2011, because from my perspective, this was the first time where we actually had an event where hacking hit everybody at home. And we, in 2011, if you can flash back, it was over 10 years ago, believe it or not, uh, we had the PlayStation Network come online. And this was the first time where it was easy for everyone to game against each other on the internet. It, prior to that, it was mostly something you did in your home against the computer. Now you're gaming against people across the world. And people loved it and were obsessed with it, and it really took off. And as right when everyone was obsessed with it, malicious hackers took down the PlayStation Network in April of 2011. And it was really dramatic. No one could believe the entire PlayStation Network had been taken down. We had a great number of, of people that were quite distraught. They had come to rely on gaming and, and all kinds of weird cultural phenomenons happened where families started eating, eating dinner together again and being interested in each other's lives. And, and that time came back from gaming. Uh, don't worry, a month later it all came back. PlayStation Network was back again in May and June, so it, we went back to what is our new normal. But I think the whole world, especially the United States, became very aware of cybersecurity when the Sony PlayStation Network went down for over a month in 2011. How did they do it? So the enemy in this case was cyber criminals, and they were just doing what they do, which is probing every entity on the internet for weaknesses. And they found one. They found that Sony had left a really easy vulnerability open in their PlayStation network. And it left them open to what's called a SQL injection attack. And what that means is on any standard web page, there are username and password fields where you put in your credentials. Well, and if you don't do your job right as a network administrator and a cybersecurity expert, a malicious hacker can put commands into those fields rather than Jamie Hevick and my password. I would put in if star equals star display all records. And so those commands that go in there, uh, they, in this case, Sony had done nothing to defend their network. Those commands went in and it spit out millions of records, uh, usernames, passwords, credit card information, everything that they had captured about everyone that was on the PlayStation Network. So they had left themselves open to one of the most easy to execute attacks out there. And it led to $171 million in lost revenue right away. And believe it or not, a $2 billion hit to their market cap at the time. So cyber criminals and SQL injection were what, what were the culprits in this case. The next thing we will, I'll talk about is, a, a, is in 2017, we saw the first real, in, really widespread infections of ransomware with the WannaCry attack. WannaCry was a delivery method for ransomware that, that we were not prepared to defend against at the time. And you see on the, on the screen right now, you see the curve of what typically happens when a new variant of an attack method comes out where there's a huge spike. Uh, we, we, we combat it with some basic fixes. Uh, it doesn't quite get it done and you see the massive infection and then it dies out as we learn how to defend against it. But this is 11 days and this was the first time we saw this, the scope of attack this broad. And as you can see on May 17th, 2017, over 400,000 people got hit by ransomware. 
And ransomware is especially nasty. It hits us right in, hits us hit at home. For home computer users, what ransomware does is it encrypts all of their, their user data, things that are precious to them. For example, baby pictures and, and, and all kinds of documents that are internal to, the, to your home. In the business, it, it veils this, this ransomware will attempt to encrypt your critical business data. And if it's successful, you will lose everything that is most important to your business because it's become heavily encrypted and you don't have the keys to decrypt it. The ransomware attackers will typically demand, they'll extort you, they'll demand that you pay a fee in order to get your data back. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But this was in 2017, this was the first widespread outbreak that made us all really worry about the future in cybersecurity and, and how we're not really secure. So this was cyber criminals attacking everyone with the ransomware attack tool. So ransomware has really exploded and that was from 2017 and it's only become more prevalent. They doubled in, the attacks doubled in 2019. So at least 621 government agencies, healthcare providers and schools were hit. And, and the number is probably quite a bit larger. These are the only ones that publicly acknowledge, acknowledge that they have been attacked largely without repercussions. These are, are, are actors that are, are from outside of the country. And in some cases, they, the countries that they reside in encourage them to do this kind of, this is economic activity for some smaller countries in the world. This year has been equally as bad. We've seen a 715% increase in ransomware attacks. So there, it's a tough attack to defend against and it keeps increasing. So if you are unfortunate enough to be uh, targeted and successfully attacked, you're gonna find yourself in a really interesting position. You're gonna contact the FBI and they are going to tell you, please don't pay the ransom. Whenever you pay the ransom, you encourage malicious hackers to keep doing this. Please don't pay the ransom. And you may not get everything back because these are criminals after all. And, and so they're encouraging you not to do that. Your insurance company is going to emphatically tell you, pay the ransom, here's how you do it, pay it right now. The insurance company is in the business of mitigating risk and, and reducing loss. So when they look at the calculation of what it costs for you to not have your data every day compared with a $50,000 payment to a hacker, they're gonna say, let's pay the $50,000 and roll the dice and see if we can get everything back sooner. So your insurance company is gonna, they'll likely provide you with someone who knows how to do this, knows how to make the payment in Bitcoin and, and will pay off these ransomware artists. The bad news is you don't always get everything back. Obviously, these are criminals that you're dealing with. They will give you something and they will often, you'll get a lot that's useful, but at the same time, you will likely not, you'll likely not get everything that you had hoped. So the uh, even if they give you the, the right keys, sometimes you don't get everything back. And this is in 2020, and this has been evolving over the years. We see that, that they target different sectors at different times. But I think what is fair to say is that we've seen increased targeting the manufacturing sector. And this is data through September of this year. We saw that, that as you can see, between services, education, government, and manufacturing, this is really what's being targeted by the malicious hackers. On to a quick discussion about data breaches, and we've all heard major stories in the news about data breaches. Here you see a list of the ma most major data breaches up to 2017. The worst being Yahoo, uh, the loss of 3 billion records. Uh, they obviously are not taking things as seriously as we would like them to about how they protect our personal data that they acquire on our own. So, you, so here you see a big list of everything that's gone wrong as far as protecting our data. The worst and I guess most offensive to me is the Equifax data breach. And that was March of 2017. And the credit data of 145 million customers was exposed in March of 2017. Equifax left some, some doors open. They, they, they made some 
some critical errors in defense, and lots of our credit data was released to malicious hackers. The way they got in was through a consumer complaint web portal, and you can kind of picture a company like Equifax kind of deciding they want a consumer complaint web portal and just acting fast and putting it up there without making sure it complied with all of their centralized cybersecurity policies. And I believe that's what happened here. Uh, by the time they went in to get Equif the, the hackers out of Equifax, the malicious hackers had put 30 different backdoors in the system. So they had 30 discrete ways to get back into Equifax after they, they cleared them out. But the most, the, I guess what I, I mentioned offensive, the thing that is most difficult for me to deal with is that there are no negative repercussions for Equifax. I didn't choose to do business with Equifax. They're one of the main three main credit rating agencies in the country, and they have my data, and, and there's nothing I can do about it. I can't choose to not use Equifax. And so there were really no negative repercussions for Equifax. Two years later, they have the same market share they did before in this space. So that's, uh, to me, an indicator that we're not doing things right as far as policy and how we deal with cybersecurity here in, in the United States as far as data protection. So in this case, again, we're, we're dealing with cyber criminals and they exploited a web vulnerability. They found a way into a website. Once they got into Equifax, they pivoted, they found a way to move to other systems and then they slowly exfiltrated the data in a way that made it very difficult for us to detect that they were in there and that they were removing the data and that allowed them to persist in Equifax for quite a while. So when we talk about these data breaches, what is data? Uh, data is the exhaust of the information age. Every time we visit a web page, every single thing we do on the internet, every purchase we make, every, every chat that we communicate in, every image that we post, that lives forever. It's become so cheap to store data that you, that, they might as well just keep all of our information forever. And in the future, they can always go back and run a search and see what we did now. So as we move around the internet, we're just, the exhaust of our movements is behind us and it persists forever. It never really goes away. And there's so much of it now based on how we use the internet that worldwide, we create more data per day. So today we will create more data than we did from the beginning of time until 2004. And that's how much data our, our, our current society and the way that we produce leaves behind everywhere. And, and it causes some generational gaps and some different thinking about privacy. And that Scott McNeely was one of the most forward thinking uh, looking thinkers on this back in, in 1999, saying you have zero privacy anyway, get over it not a widely accepted view at the time, but it, largely it's become reality. And, and the, the second view that I that changed my thinking on this was in the summer of 2013, when I was teaching a bunch of cybersecurity to some local high school students, a really good student wrote a nice paper about how privacy is obsolete. And when we talked about it, he told the class and myself, privacy is obsolete, only people your age think it even exists. So uh, perhaps I'm getting a little bit old and I'm not with the times. I try to adapt and, and, and maybe our thought that, that our privacy and our data is something we can protect is a bit outdated in the information age. So here we're moving on to information warfare. And this is a, a very graphic image of an oil pipeline in, in Turkey in 2008. And this was the first time we started to think about critical infrastructure and cyber attacks on, on critical devices. And what you see here is an explosion uh, on a gas pipeline in Turkey. And the, the subsequent computer forensics indicated that this was likely done by a hacker who did not know what they were doing. And they were just probing the internet for weaknesses. They found a way into a system. They were able to manipulate some control valves and switches and, and did so just to see what they could do. And that led to this explosion and the first graphic illustration of what cyber warfare and cybersecurity might mean in the future. And so this attack 
The enemy is what we call a script kitty. To be a cybersecurity professional, you build out your toolbox of all kinds of hacking tools and, and utilities and things that can do things for you, reconnaissance, penetration, pivoting once you're in a network. And those tools can be pretty sophisticated. And in the hands of someone that's been trained to use them, they're very powerful. In the hands of someone that has not been trained to use them, you get something like this, this explosion, where these tools are widely available on the internet. They're not as powerful if you don't know how to configure them properly, but they can be launched indiscriminately and, and just to see what happens. And that's what happened here. This is a publicly, publicly available hacking tools that were just applied to the internet at whole and it led to this. So this is an enemy and an attack that unfortunately we all have to think about, which is we might just be randomly attacked by someone because they can. But information warfare is, is, uh, is something that I find really interesting. And to understand everything about information warfare, we, we really have to understand the saga of Ukraine. And you may have heard in the news that there's been back and forth between Russia and Ukraine, and, and part of it is over Crimea. And in the bottom of this graphic, you see with the red lines, large island on uh, the Black Sea, and that is Crimea. It's a really valuable piece of real estate. And, and that's a big part of the current uh, conflict that's going on. But information warfare is a really, uh, this is, is the playground of the Russians as they develop their information warfare capabilities. And just to give you some background on what has been happening since 2004, the Ukraine has gone back and forth between, between being pro-Western and pro-Russian. And, and it's, uh, the Russians are very, very interested in keeping the leadership of the Ukraine pro-Russian. And an example, it, back in 2004, you had the pro-Russian Victor, Viktor Yanukovych running against the pro-Western Viktor Yushchenko. And in um, and, and something you probably remember seeing elsewhere with the Russians, Viktor Yushchenko got poisoned two weeks before this 04 election. However, he did hold on, he did win, and Ukraine was pro-Western for a number of years, up until 2010. So this back and forth is what you'll see and, and is what is currently going on all the way up till today. And just to graphically illustrate this poisoning concept, this is the before and after with Viktor Yushchenko. Two weeks before he was due to, to be the candidate in Ukraine, he was poisoned very likely by the Russians. So fast forward to 2014, we still have this kind of back and forth. The Yanukovych, the, the pro-Russian government got thrown out in 2014, and the Russians were very upset about that and launched a coordinated campaign to undermine people's faith in how the economy could run. So they launched cyber attacks on media, finance, energy, government, transportation. Every part of Russian society was targeted by the Russians. After Russia invaded and annexed Crimea in April, they just went after them one time after another. Every year, uh, they, the Russians turn out all the lights in the major cities in Ukraine around the holidays. They, they did that effectively in 2016 and 2015. In 2016, the Ukraine finance ministry was trying to put together their budget and found that the Russians had gotten in and destroyed terabytes of their data they didn't even know where their finances were for a number of months after a very effective cyber attack. And um, so the Ukraine, as this kind of expands and Ukraine continues to be the test bed for Russian cyber capabilities, the Ukraine tried moving their web presence to the United States. So they moved all of their websites and a lot of their data to a data center in the United States. And that did not deter the Russians. The Russians continued attacking and that kind of brings to mind the, the scary part of this information warfare is that the ability to escalate, the ability that this cyber warfare can cross borders very quickly. But as we analyze these attacks that happened in the, in the middle of the 2010s, we found that a very common tool that they would use, the Russians would use against the Ukrainians, Ukrainians were the, was the Black Energy Trojan. That was their way to get into systems. And then the kill disk payload, which was the weapon that they used once they were in, which just wipes out hard drives. 
So the scary thing is that we found that same exact attack signature within our power and utility and water utilities in the same time frame. So they were there, but they didn't pull the trigger. And that's how what we see in Ukraine ends up on our home turf before too long. So the um, in, in this case, you had the, the enemy was the, uh, a state actor, which is Russia. And they used a Word document that requests in, or asks you to enable your macros. That was the way in using this black energy Trojan. And then kill disk was the how they just wiped out hard drives once they got in. The final escalation, or the most serious to date, was in spring of 2017, and this also leaked out into the international sphere. The Russian hackers infl infiltrated Lycos, which was is the Ukrainian version of QuickBooks. So everybody in Ukraine is running their version of QuickBooks, the Lycos software. And what they did was they used those software updates. Whenever anybody in, in Ukraine wanted to update their version of QuickBooks, when they pulled down the software update, it pulled down a virus infection that very quickly destroyed all the hard drives in the company. And, and most cyber attacks are more discriminate. They're, they, they're, they're specifically targeting certain things. This weapon that the Russians have piloted here in Ukraine just destroys things. And as you see in the end, it did over $10 billion in damage nationwide when it got out of the Ukrainian environment. And over 300 international companies were hit, excuse me, 300 companies were hit in Ukraine. And our best estimate is 10% of all computers in Ukraine were wiped out. 10% of all computers. So this was a, a really a cyber weapon of mass destru destruction that they could not contain once they, they launched it. And it's pretty scary stuff. So here you have the enemy is, a, is Russia, a state actor, and they compromised a trusted partner, which you may understand the, the parallel to the, our defense in, industry right now. They compromised a trusted partner and used that to infect everyone. So this kind of continues, um, and you see the Russians attack France and Germany to try to, try to affect their election systems. And the attack that they use there is just called doxing. So they went in, they, they, they were able to find a bunch of, of embarrassing emails in, from Emmanuel Macron's campaign and the German Bundestag, and they used them in order to try to achieve the results that they, they wanted to see with regard to who gets elected in foreign countries. They, they took a similar approach to the United States. And, and so in, in early 2000, in late 2015, early 2016, we saw the Russians start to attack the United States, not from an election standpoint, but from a just dividing us standpoint. And what they did is they consistently, in the months leading up to the election, uh, they, they, they got into social media and they made a whole bunch of posts that tried to get Americans to hate each other. And they would focus on the most divisive issues. And you, you've seen these probably in your social media, where you see something that says, you have to be a special kind of stupid to think this, or you're not a real American if you think that. And, and the whole point is just to get us to fight each other so that we can't be a united force to fight the Russians. And, and to, I think it's safe to say to a large degree they, they succeeded. So that was what they were doing in late 15, early 16. As we approached 2016 in November, they shifted their resources to promoting the Republican candidate and attacking the Democratic candidate. And, and the Democratic institution played right along by uh, allowing a high level campaign operative to, to get attacked by the most easy attack to defend against. It was just a phishing attack. And the result was tons of embarrassing emails from the Democratic campaign being released in the months leading up to the election. The automated nature of the attack was really interesting as well. We'd never seen anything at the time quite of that scale, where 20% of the Twitter content in the four weeks prior to the election was generated by 50 million bots. So things that you think are people posting are just robots posting, artificial intelligence driven robots, including over 50,000 Russian linked bots that we could specifically attribute to Russia. 
So in this case, it's, it's Russia again, a state actor of Russia, and their method is phishing, doxing, and digital propaganda. The good news is um, they shifted and they did not attack our election to the same degree. And in, uh, here in what we did see is that they exploited the COVID pandemic. And they, they used the same methods to try to spread disinformation about COVID internally in the United States, especially trying to undermine our trust in a, in a potential vaccine. And that was the main thing that we saw that they did. Um, but they're also getting more advanced. These bots that, that populate social media are, are getting very, very advanced and hard to defeat. They've advanced to the point now where the, the bots are having conversations with one another on social media, make, establishing your level of trust that they are real. So again, Russia in digital propaganda. But the good news is, is that as of right now, it looks like we have done the, the CISA Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency really did a nice job of, of defending us, our elections this year from foreign interference. And all signs are that we had a, 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 an election free of foreign interference in 2020. So uh, a quick side note to talk about something good. And here you see um, the, the story of Stuxnet. And uh, if you can think back, this was during the Obama administration. The Iranians were building a nuclear weapon. Uh, they were refining uranium. They were very happy that they had established the capability to do so. In the picture, in the lab coat, you see uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the president of Iran at the time, who was especially vociferous in his attacks on our country. Uh, and and they, were, they were succeeding in your fry, r refining uranium. And rather than do it above ground in those facilities that you see there, uh, they, produced, they, they created this facility underneath that mountain. That's in the Tanz Iran. And under that granite, we could not attack them with conventional weapons. So to a certain degree, they were, were succeeding. They were, they were refining uranium using those centrifuges that you see in that picture, which are priceless. Yet the centrifuges themselves are banned internationally. So those came from North Korea. The expertise on how to use them came from Pakistan and A.Q. Khan, their chief scientist, and they were succeeding. They were refining uranium. And the United States decided to act. And we launched the most sophisticated cyber weapon at the time on that facility in Natanz, Iran. And we caused, we believe, 80% of those priceless centrifuges to spin at 200% of their design speed and melt without a shot fired, without any invasion, without any bombs dropped, the United States knocked back the Iranian capability to refine uranium by about three years. And that was one of the one for the good guys. And we here in central New York take a bit of pride in that because we have the Air Force Research Lab in Rome, New York, which is the beating heart of our, our economy in this area. And it's entirely possible that some of the engineers and researchers right outside our door helped contribute to Stuxnet. One for the good guys. Uh, last thread of those three is cyber espionage. And, and we see that over and over again, especially the Chinese, they are attacking us and trying to steal our intellectual property. They have a, a People's Liberation Army unit that's dedicated to this and they've had tremendous success. Their primary method is of getting in, into our systems is spear phishing. In spear phishing, you've all seen the basic phishing attacks where they send you an email and you click on a link and they get into your system. But in this case, spear phishing is more sophisticated where they research you and they find out what you do and what you like to do. And in this case, what they're doing is they would find out, for example, if they researched me, they'd find out that I'm Jake Mihivik. I like to go snowmobiling. I ride Skidoo snowmobiles, and my friend that I ride with is Phil Potosik. They would then fashion an email to me that looks like it's from Phil, contains something like, hey, check out the new Skidoo calendar. It's got the new Skidoo calendar attached to it, and inside that attachment is the payload that I infect myself with. And I never know that I've done it. When I open that catalog that looks like it's from my snowmobiling friend about snowmobiles we ride together, I have no reason to be suspicious. 
And unless I talk to him later and find out he didn't send that email, I would never know that I'd, I'd infected myself and my company. And that's why spear phishing is so effective and so, so tough to defend against and why China uses it all over the place. That is the Chinese unit that, that runs the attacks. The most successful attack they ran was Operation Shady Rat. Uh, Rat stands for Remote Access Tool, where they, they got into a whole bunch of defense industry manufacturers and defense supply chain entities and slowly exfiltrated all of our intellectual property. And this is the result. Uh, that Shady Rat hack, hack happened in 2013. And in 2016, China rolled out the J31, which looks an awful lot like the US F-35 that we've spent probably a trillion dollars developing at this point in time. They've also been, China has been successful in using spear phishing to target our actual defense capabilities, including satellites. And we believe that they had the ability to make one of our satellites their satellite in 2019. So what we're seeing here is that we are open to all of these attacks because we're under investing in cyber defenses. And, and, and a Nobel Prize winner in economic, economics, Daniel Kahneman, tried to figure out why. And he came up with a prospect theory. And this is the audience participation part of my presentation usually. So if you could just play along, do so silently, but I have two questions for you. The first question, if you were given a choice to receive a guaranteed $500, or you could have a 50-50 chance for a thousand or nothing. So I can either give you a guaranteed 500, or you can either take a chance at either a thousand dollars or nothing. Which would you choose? All of the research shows, and every time we do this presentation, everyone chooses the guaranteed 500. When it comes to profits, we think about things in a certain way. The next question is how we think about loss. If you were confronted with a guaranteed loss of $500, or you could take a chance and you could lose either zero or a thousand, guaranteed $500 loss, or a chance to lose nothing or double, what would you choose? And in the research, and every time we do this presentation in person, everyone chooses to roll the dice. They say, there's a chance I'm gonna lose nothing. Let's take a chance, maybe I won't get hit. And that affects our thinking in how we choose to defend our networks. There's a chance we won't get attacked. So in this case, our, the enemy is our genetic predispositions our enemies ourselves because we underestimate threats naturally. That's how our minds work. What it's led to is we also under underinvest in cyber defense as a nation. We buy very expensive aircraft carriers. Every year we spend the equivalent of one aircraft carrier, 2% of the defense budget on cyber defenses. And we also, especially this current administration, don't take cybersecurity as seriously as we should. The, our, some of our best cyber warriors were moved out of the White House and, and, and stopped having influence on how we do things. It comes down to the forces of good and the forces of evil. Right now, we just don't have enough people defending our networks, and it's a major problem. We have 508,000 unfilled cybersecurity positions nationwide. It's the most in-demand in, uh, uh, work role in the country right now. At least 22,000 unfilled positions within the federal government. And these are not low level positions. If you do a search, they all start at 70 plus. So the incentive is there, but we're just not producing them. And what, are, what it leads to is all of these fancy tools that we develop with our high-end engineering, they get stolen. We build them and they get stolen and used against us. And it happens over and over and over again. What we're doing about it is MPCC has partnered with the National Security Agency and the Department of Homeland Security. They're investing in us and they're investing in 340 different community college and, and university cybersecurity programs across the country to the tune of 26 million this year, just helping us be better at our, our jobs. So the enemy in this case is a, a huge workforce shortage and the attack um, is we're attacking that problem by investing in education. 
and at MVCC, our hackathon where students do real life exercises, defending systems from our industry partners is how they get real life experience and they get to really enjoy what they're doing and become good at what they're doing as well. So quick takeaways is there are prevalent and persistent enemies and attacks across cybercrime, information warfare, and cyber espionage, each of which uh, could lead to you and your organization becoming collateral damage. We are the best in the world at developing advanced tools and weapons, but we just don't have enough people helping to defend them. And small manufacturers, if, if you take advantage of the services such as what AIM offers you and FuseHub offers you, you can limit your attack surface and, and make some minor investments to really make it so that you are as secure as you can be and malicious hackers would move on to an easier target. But lastly, please be aware of your natural proclivity to underestimate the risk of cyber attack and, and hope that it doesn't hit you and that you do not experience any loss. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jake, for that fantastic presentation. Um, at this time, I'd like to remind everybody that the questions and answers period is now open. We have about a 13 minutes to take your questions, and I do see them um, starting to come through now. So, um, uh, folks, please take the time in your control panel under the questions tab. Uh, submit your questions for Everton or for Jake Mihivic. Uh, there is qu uh, one question here, and I believe this one is going to be for Jake. Uh, Jake, a member of the audience is asking, why has the manufacturing sector become more of a target over time? And is it just large manufacturers where the attacks are increasing? Thank you, that's a really good question. And I, I think the, the interconnectedness of the defense contracting industry is, is what makes everyone such a target these days, Corey. And when you think about the hackers want to pick the easiest way in. And uh, when, when our defense manufacturers when they when they communicate when they send information when they move software between different levels of the supply chain that's a serious risk and it's hard to evaluate everything that moves up and down the supply chain for security so you can see how just like the ukrainian hackers infiltrated quickbooks and use that to move around and in fact everyone in that country you can see how it would be a very popular attack vector to compromise kind of the weakest link in the in the defense supply chain and, and and leverage that to spread out and do more damage as things expanded and i think that's one of the reasons why you see manufacturers being increasingly targeted i'll also note that the shortage of cybersecurity professionals really hits small manufacturers hard especially in that very few small manufacturers can hire someone that would be skilled at defending their network from cyber attacks. And, and that creates a huge challenge for small manufacturers. And, and I think from my perspective, a great incentive to work with organizations like yours, Corey, where you, you kind of get to, to have a timeshare on a cybersecurity expert. Uh, very few people can afford one. In this case, the expertise that you have gets to get spread out across lots of likely targets so that it's not only less expensive, it's inexpensive, but it also accomplishes the mission. Okay, thank you, Jake. Uh, Jake, I think we'll stay with you here on this one. Uh, we have a manufacturer in attendance this morning and they're asking, what should we consider when, when our employees wanna use a cloud uh, file sharing service like Dropbox or Google Drive? Well, that's a really good question. And, and unfortunately, those tools have become so ubiquitous and so helpful that it's hard to it, it, it's really hard to just choose not to use them but one thing that i think that some advice that they would get from from aim once an audit was was uncovered is that you can do what's called network segregation where you can keep certain personal activities segregated from business activities uh, you can also just minimize that attack surface by not giving access to computer systems to people that don't need it and, and it's really about minimization. It's, it's how many people need access to that Gmail, to that Google Drive, 
the fewer people that you can give access, the less likely it is to be successfully attacked. So, so I, what I would say is minimize the number of people that can upload and download from those cloud sharing utilities. And, and to people that don't need full access to it, just provide the data uh, over email or some other old school method of dis disseminating data. It, convenient isn't always the best. Convenient is almost always less secure. Thanks, Jake. Everton, I'm gonna have the next question for you, if you don't mind, please. Uh, one of the registrants this morning is asking again for the, the uh, uh, website where they can find the information. So if we could please go over that. And there's a, uh, a follow-on question um, that they're asking. And they're asking about, can you speak a little bit more about the opportunities that might exist for a company joining the cohort and some of the benefits? So they're looking for the website and the benefits. Okay, so let's um, jump right into the benefits. As I said before, uh, you'll be getting access to an online interactive nine-session training course for self-assessment through Teachable. And, uh, and this is very important because uh, once you're involved with this, you then will become the expert at uh, assessing, um, you know, where you are at and your company is at. And, uh, you know, at the end of that, you'll be getting a letter of completion that you could use to show, um, you know, possibly some of your uh, <clears throat> the companies that you work with that you're indeed making every effort to comply with um, you know, cybersecurity requirements. Yeah, there's the training will um, you know provide content up to um, CMMC level three equivalent. So once you're done with that, you um, you know hoping you'll be prepared when the auditors come for level three when when that comes around. Okay, uh, very very important part of it um, is certainly the office hours, the virtual office hours with um, Ames, our very own um, uh, Paul Laporte, and, and Paul has done many many. Um, assessments and he's a good guy to meet with to help you with that. We have the networking among the cohort members in the DOD supply chain and getting to know your uh, your fellow manufacturers in the DOD supply chain, you know, to be able to help each other by understanding what our best practices um, you know, when it comes to cyber. Uh, and of course, you know, the six or seven cohort members that we talk about that will benefit from the grant of $6,000 towards a personalized self-assessment. You know, this would cost you $7,500, and this grant is going to pay $6,000 for that. And so that's, um, you know, a very, very important uh, part of the benefit. Okay, of course, um, the grant, uh, the grant uh, winners is also get the same letter of completion. Um, <clears throat> the preparation for meeting compliance, you know, CMMC level three, I can't overstate that, but it's very, very important because if you don't meet the CMMC requirements, based on where you're at, you will not be able to bid on certain defense projects. And, and, uh, that's very, very important, all right? Um, so those are the benefits. Um, in terms of um, where do you um, apply, you go to the New York MEP website, and this is newyorkmep.org slash cohort dash apply. So it's N-E-W-Y-O-R-K-M-E-P dot O-R-G backslash I mean, slash C O H O R T hyphen A P P L Y slash. Okay, so that's how you would get to that. Thank you. Thank you, Everton. Okay, folks, we've got about five minutes left. So if you can keep the questions coming in into the control panel, we'll do our very best to get, get to uh, as many of the questions as we possibly can. There is one more coming in now. Uh, Jake, I think we'll direct this one to you. Um, a person in attendance is asking how much how much use are antivirus? Oh, excuse me, I just uh, switched screens here. How much use are antivirus and anti-malware subscriptions? Well, that is a good question, and uh, they they are very important. Uh, the one thing to know about them is that they protect you against everything that has that we know about. And, and so the hack, malicious hackers will consistently reuse work they've already done and tools that are already there because there's no penalty not to. They, they can launch old attacks against systems all day long without any repercussions. So for that perspective, it's important to have anti-malware and anti 
uh, and, and antivirus software installed. But it really needs to be a complete solution. You, you need to have those that software working as well as a kind of a, a network perimeter defense, as well as really good policies. And to some degree, unfortunately, lots of large companies are now shifting their resources away from trying to keep hackers out and towards trying to limit the damage that they can do once they, they get in. And mostly assuming that at some point you will have some kind of network intrusion. So that antivirus, that anti-malware, they are very effective against things like we talked about with ransomware. In fact, they may be saving your life right now from a ransomware attack that could really ruin your holidays. Uh, but at the same time, that software is one piece of, of what should be kind of an overall strategy of uh, if a malicious hacker were to get in your network, are you, are, do you have things segregated? Do you have your important things locked away in such a way that they can't get into them? And, and that's, that requires some planning and some serious thinking. And uh, when we do penetration testing in our industry, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to show what we could do if we were to get in the network, unless you put the controls in place that AIM and, and an assessment would, would recommend to you. Jake, as you're mentioning hackers, that does dovetail nicely into another question that we have here. How do hackers protect their privacy? <laughs> Well, uh, first of all, I, I always couch that with saying, we like to say malicious hackers because hackers are my friends. I've, I've got a, a thousand hackers. I, I, it's not a derogatory term in our industry. So malicious hackers, they, uh, they have the use of very sophisticated cybersecurity tools that makes attribution really difficult. It's really hard to, for us to find out who is attacking us. And, and it's really easy to be anonymous on the internet right now between Tor and all of the uh, anonymizing engines that are out there. You can make it so that your traffic is stripped of all of its technically identifying content by the time it arrives at its destination. So it's, there are technology ways to, to obscure themselves and, and make it hard for us to attribute an attack. But they also, many of them have state level defenses and uh, between Ukraine, Russia, a number of, of third world countries, they, there are some serious san state sanctioned operations running right now that feed into the leaders of those countries where it is a complete safe haven. And, and the United Nations and other organizations have tried to put in an extradition treaty for cybersecurity and, and no luck so far. As of right now, if, if you were attacked by a foreign hacker, they are going to get away with it. Thanks, Jake. In sure. respect to time, uh, we have uh, one final question here, Jake, and I think this might be a follow-on from the cloud uh, file sharing question, which you previously had. And, and the question is about a share file. Is share file safe? The way to think about that question is, is how you authenticate. How do you access those files? And when you log into your local network, you have a username and password and ideally a couple multi-factor authentication. If you can get multi-factor authentication onto any shared file, onto any sharing that you do on the internet, you're going to be relatively safe. So if you have to put in a code that gets sent to your phone as well as your password, you're relatively safe. The things that are not safe are weak passwords as your only way of authenticating that you are you. And that's why in some cases, for example, on the Air Force Research Lab, you need a password, you need a physical key that you plug into the computer, and you also need a digital key that's updated every, all the time. So that's three-factor authentication. Most of the country has moved to two-factor authentication where it's not just a password, it's something else. And if you have multi-factor authentication, you can have some degree of comfort that you're relatively operating in a safe way. Okay, thank you, Jake. Uh, well, folks, that does conclude our program for this morning. Um, on behalf of Mohawk Valley Community College, the Advanced Institute for Manufacturing, Empire State Development, uh, FUSUB, and all of our partners on this grant, wanted to thank everybody for taking your time and spending it here with us. As a uh, brief um, reminder here, 
The next uh, webcast, which is part four of our five-part webinar series, will be on December 15th. And the next workshop will be a virtual workshop, and it's held on December 9th. And just again, as a reminder for um, any additional information regarding the 2020 Cybersecurity Assistance Grant and to join the cohort, please visit uh, newyorkmep.org. And I hope everybody has a safe, happy, and healthy, healthy Thanksgiving. So thank you, everybody, for joining, and take care, and have a great day. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays. Goodbye.